politics, immigration, and activism, including storming Caesar's palace, how black mothers fought their own war on poverty. So, Annalise. Thank you. Thank you for coming out on a, on a rainy um, early May night. I appreciate it. And uh, I appreciate being back in this library where I've had a great experience a couple of times before. Um, I think one of the times I was here was the 50th anniversary of the Declaration of War on Poverty uh, in January 2014. And um, also to talk about the Triangle uh, Shirtwaist Factory fire. Um, some years back. So it's really nice to be back here. I have to say that libraries have never seemed more urgent and mm -hmm. people who appreciate books of all kinds um, have never seemed more urgent as we, you know, as, as we begin this talk, I, there was yet a, you know, a, another, another book ban passed in Florida. So I'm really, I'm really grateful to be in this space. And, uh, and also I teach across the river and uh, I teach in private institution, but, um, you know, K-12, a lot of what I teach in New Hampshire is illegal. Um, so I think uh, the ability to talk openly um, about history, and in this particular talk, very, very recent history, um, and controversial histories has never been more important. So this project started, actually, um, on the 100th anniversary of the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory fire. Uh, which took place March 25th, 1911, uh, in New York City. It was the worst industrial disaster. Um, I just wanted to show you some photographs of the people I'm about to talk about. So March 25th, uh, 1911, um, supposedly uh, fireproof modern factory building on Green Street, Washington Place off uh, Washington Square Park in Greenwich Village. Uh, there's a fire. Uh, that starts on uh, the top three floors of what is now the Brown Chemistry Building. So um, that fire in which 146 um, young people died in front of uh, thousands of New Yorkers on a warm uh, spring afternoon was a real turning point in, um, in the relationship between the American government and workplaces. Uh, there had been some fire safety laws, there had been uh, some workplace inspections and uh, you know, some codes that were developed to try to keep workers from burning up. But the truth is it happened all the time. Um, Triangle was just the most visible and the most obvious, and the victims were the youngest. Uh, the youngest was uh, between 13 and 14. Uh, the oldest, I think, was in her early 30s. So it was, it was young people, it was mostly young women, it was really a lot of girls. Um, who died, and they died right in front of thousands of New Yorkers. And so things began to change. And then every year, there, and so many, many laws were passed, and uh, factory investigating commissions were set up all through um, uh, the Northeastern industrial states, and, uh, and in Illinois, Chicago, and Cleveland. Uh, you began to get you know, more active presence of, of government in, uh, in the workplace. And one of the witnesses of that fire, who lived around the corner, uh, was a social worker by the name of Frances Perkins, um, who would go on to become uh, the first industri woman industrial commissioner, first industrial commissioner of New York State, and then Franklin Roosevelt's secretary of labor, the first woman to serve in a presidential cabinet. And while she watched that tragedy, she vowed, she's gonna devote the rest of my career um, to trying to ensure that nothing like this happens again. And so out of that came many of the labor regulations uh, that we still depend on. The, um, the Fair Labor Standards Act, uh, which uh, mandates working hours be you know, no more than 40 and guarantees overtime and guarantees minimum safety standards in the workplace. And out of that came the Occupational Safety and Health Administration. All of that infrastructure has been recently gutted, which helps to explain the movement that I'm about to talk about. Okay, so, um, on the 100th anniversary of the fire, I was involved with a bunch of people in New York who were establishing, uh, doing a series of commemorations. And we did one in the Great Hall of the People in Cooper Union. Um, and that was a really important place to do this. It had been the site of many social justice meetings uh, in the, the 19th and early 20th century. You had um, Chief Red Cloud of the Arapaho 
uh, in the 1870s, decrying you know U.S. military wars against his people. You had uh, Frederick Douglass, uh, you know, speaking against slavery a little bit earlier. You had women's suffrage uh, meetings, and in 1909, you had a meeting of young workers, uh, garment workers in New York City. Uh, who, in spite of everybody advising them not to do it, voted to go on a general strike because their conditions were so awful. Um, one factory that wouldn't settle was the Triangle Factory. Um, and so two years after the strike uh, came, came the fire. So, uh, but that meeting had started in the Great Hall of the People. Um, so we had, this, we had this commemoration 100 years later. And it was at this commemoration, I will... Um, come back to some of these earlier slides, but it was at this commemoration that I met Kalpana Actor, um, who is a modern day uh, garment union activist. She is uh, the leader of a remarkable movement of women garment workers in Bangladesh, um, where um, many of us have clothes. If we, we looked at our labels, we would find uh, clothing probably made in Bangladesh. Um, in 2011, when I met her, uh, Bangladesh was second only to China in exporting clothes that, that are worn um, in the West as part of the, the fast fashion revolution. Um, and so I met, so she came up on the stage and she said, in Great Hall of the People, she said, in Bangladesh, it's not 2011, it's 1911. And that started this project. What I, 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 at first I thought, oh, this is about just exportation um, of the garment industry after it was unionized here in the US um, and overseas conditions are bad, but they're not so bad here. Um, I followed up my meeting with Kalpona, with many other meetings, because like, she had so much to tell me. But, um, but what I learned in traveling around the world is that um, it's 1911 all over the world. And it's 1911 again in the United States. Mm -hmm. Because as we have driven down wages and driven down safety conditions, um, and, and this book looks at several different industries, it looks at garments, um, it looks at um, the fast food industry, and there my, um, my interpreter and the person who took me in was this young man named Blue Rainier, um, who uh, was an organizer for um, uh, the McDonald's workers movement. Um, but also you can see him wearing an I Can't Breathe shirt um, he was the person who made me understand that the fast food workers uprising that started in this country um, in 2011 and spread around the world um, was also a Black Lives Matter protest. Um, and as Blue told me, we're the same people. <laughs> we, after we come off our third shift and we're walking home late at night, it is, you know, it is we fast food workers who are the ones who are harassed um, and questioned by police and uh, who often went into trouble. And he pointed out to me that in Ferguson, Missouri, um, after Michael Brown's killing in the summer of 2014, um, when there were riots and protests, um, it was the McDonald's workers who were active in the Fight for 15 movement that I'm gonna talk about in a minute, um, who they let people who'd been tear gassed come in and they poured milk into their eyes um, to help them uh, to, to get their sight back and to relieve the pain of, of being of tear gas in their eyes. So, um, so what I did is I looked all over the world. I looked at garment work, which I'll talk about. Um, I looked at big box and retail work. Um, I looked at um, hotel workers. Um, these are two young women um, who organized a global movement of hotel housekeepers, uh, Chim Sitar and Pau um, Chimoni. And um, I was able to speak to them in Phnom Penh, Cambodia um, in 2015. Um, they were very young. Chim Sitar there is only, I think she was 27 when I first interviewed her. And I asked her what she wanted to do with her life. And she said, I want to do this. I want to keep on organizing. She said, but I'd like to go to law school eventually. I'm not sure I'm going to live that long. Um, she's in prison now. Um, the Hun Sen government has um, struck out at her because she organizes in hotels where lots of folks from around the world come. And um, the flow of foreign money um, into Cambodia is something that um, that the communist government um, does not want to stop. I also interviewed fast food workers in the Philippines. Um, this is Joanna's sister, Nice Carnation, um, and I'll talk a little bit about, um, about the movement that, that they developed there. So it's fast food workers, hotel workers, home health care workers, um, and 
Um, the other thing, I'm going to go in to give you a sense of all the different kinds of workers um, that I spoke to, also um, uh, farm workers. Um, and uh, and the, the two people I'm going to introduce you to, the Lopez family, this is mother and son, um, are part of a multi-generational indigenous family from Oaxaca that has run the migrant circuit um, from um, the high mountains of Oaxaca, the Mixteco region, um, all the way up to British Columbia, planting and picking berries um, and lettuce. And um, so it's, it's the story of, of their organizing. So what I found when, you know, Calpona explained to me um, that, it was, that it was 1911 was that, and this is the argument of this book, um, that workers in every way were 100 years back. And obviously, you know, as we talk about all the stuff that's going on with, with women's rights and voting rights, and we're, we're, back, we're, we're going backwards at the speed of light in a terrifying, um, terrifying way. But we're also seeing a lot of resistance to that. But what I found is we've gone back in terms of wage, what money wages can buy, that has started to change as, as a result of this movement of the last 13 years and also the pandemic. Um, in terms of uh, safety and the COVID pandemic made that much, much worse. There was no way to fully investigate, even with OSHA and what we have, um, the violations of worker safety that took place for essential workers um, during, during the pandemic. Um, I, I wrote an article about them, uh, I think it was in early 2021, and, um, and there was an estimate that if OSHA, given how much its staff has been cut, was to investigate all the violations of workplace safety in terms of COVID for essential workers, um, it would take 166 years. Um, so there's just, it's, we're, we're looking at this all over again. and. Um, and so I wanted to, um, to understand how that happened. And I was also really amazed at um, the global nature of the movement that I found um, starting to investigate after um, 2011. So I'm gonna talk about that in one second, but I wanted to tell you, so the name of the book is We're All Fast Food Workers Now. And that is a quote from a graduate student I met in uh, Tampa, Florida, Teresita's Cuban Cafe in 2015. I was actually down there to talk about um, a, the Triangle Fire anniversary. It was March 25th. Um, and I learned that they had a very active living wage campaign um, in Tampa. And so I asked to meet with some folks. And I came into Teresita's Cuban Cafe. Um, and there I met Blue. Um, and I also, the home health care workers had to, had to Skype in, we didn't really have Zoom then, they had to Skype in um, because for most of them, they said fight for 15 means 15 minute breaks, right? Because our, the people we care for are so vulnerable and, and, and they have so little, little care and there's so few people to fill in for us that um, you know, we go, we often go on 24 hour shifts. So the, the home healthcare workers Skyped in um, and then along with Blue, um, I saw that there were all these people who identified themselves as graduate students and college professors. And I said, whoa, this is, this is, you know, I'm an old labor historian. This is a very different kind of working class solidarity than I've ever seen before. Um, and I asked them how a bunch of college professors ended up organizing with a bunch of fast food workers. Um, and Keegan and the others told me how much they learned from the fast food workers um, and how much they learned um, from the Walmart workers, and we'll, I'll talk a little bit more about them in a minute, but these women, these are actually California Walmart workers, but they were organizing, they organized the first strike um, on American soil um, against a Walmart a few years earlier before this meeting. So what they said to me was what Keegan said. You know, he said, we learned, we learned so much about resilience, we learned so much about um, how to organize quickly and how to organize with joy, um, and they said, we'd better do it, because if we don't, higher education will be unrecognizable in 10 years. Now, I have to tell you, that was eight years ago, and it is. It now is. So the transformation, um, although the, the, the amazing strikes that are taking place now in higher ed, I'll talk about at the end of the talk, may perhaps uh, be giving us some hope. But what Shepard said is they try to tell us, our, what happens is that Blue talked about how Every time they tried to organize, 
protests for better wages, people would scream at them and say, you know, you want, a, you want higher wages, you want a better job, go back to school. And Blue did. And he learned that the adjuncts who were teaching him at the community college where he went to school were earning a, a little less than he did per hour. And that's when he said to me, the American dream is broken um, and we have to figure out how to bring it back. What Keegan said is, he said, they try to tell us our advanced degrees make us special. He said, but that's just a lie to keep us quiet. They, think, they tell us if we do our jobs and we stay quiet, then someday we'll get that living wage and someday we'll get those tenure track jobs. He said, but the truth is, we're all fast food workers now. Um, and so that is where um, the title of this book came from. So this is a story of some kind of familiar forms of solidarity among garment workers, among farm workers, um, and some very new kinds of alliances, um, and some new recognitions in the gig economy um, about uh, which professions are poverty professions. And um, I'm, I'm incredibly privileged and lucky because I'm, I'm a tenured professor, but um, for those who work on contract, um, and those who work course to course and year to year, um, wages are very low and people have, you know, several jobs and work nights and um, work weekends and very much um, what you see, you know, also from our school teachers. Okay, so let's, let's look at the story a little bit. Um, I wanted to start um, with, um, with Fight for 15. So Fight for 15 um, began in, uh, in the U.S. Uh, after, I don't know if any of you remember, do you remember the year that, um, I think it was 2011, uh, Scott Walker as governor of Wisconsin um, got rid of collective bargaining, or tried, they did ultimately, for public employees, mandatory collective bargaining. And so the Capitol was occupied. There were, I think, upwards of 80,000 people who occupied the Capitol grounds um, in Madison. And it was that kind of really varied group of people. It was nurses, it was teachers, um, it was home health care workers, it was a lot of different kinds of workers. And Mary Kay Henry, of the, who's the president of SEIU, the um, Service Employees International Union, was there and she thought, you know, the labor movement is going to die unless we, we rethink how we organize and we think, rethink what kind of alliances we make. So um, SEIU workers began knocking on doors and talking to people about how do we build a fair economy um, and, and what kinds of things do we need to do. Well, McDonald's workers had an idea, right? They said, um, we're going to start doing what they called one-day flash strikes. And these one-day flash strikes um, were interesting because long, you know, drawn-out strikes often hurt workers, you know, as much as they hurt um, management. It's hard if you're without wages, um, you know, you don't know if you're going to get your job back. Flash strikes um, were really interesting because it was usually too fast, um, you know, for management to react in terms of being sure exactly who, who was organizing. Um, and what they did is in the age of social media, and in the age of everyone having smartphones, um, they, decided, they, they decided to try to affect people's understanding of the brand, right? So um, at McDonald's, um, well, let me, let me say one more thing. They also decided to organize internationally. They thought, we, we can, <coughs> phones can help us do this, and transnational capitalism can help us do this. They realized that um, the workers in, there were workers at McDonald's all over the world. Um, and uh, SEIU began to fly people to meet workers um, at McDonald's in other parts of the world and to bring them here. Um, and as Blue told me, he said, I learned that some people have it a lot better than me, that, won't, that uh, McDonald's workers in Denmark um, were then being paid 2015, $21 an hour, and they got a free college education. Um, and he said, and I also learned um, that some people had it far worse, um, and that there were people who were um, basically, you know, being forced to do very long shifts, to sleep behind the McDonald's, um, and this continues. As these folks have organized, um, there's a story just in the paper the last couple of days in the news about finding child workers as young as 10, hundreds of them, um, in McDonald's franchises across um, Kentucky. So this movement will have to start again. Um, 
but we're in a moment when even the prohibitions on child labor are being questioned. Anyway, um, they, they were very, very smart. Um, in the year before 2012, um, when they had their first big strike, um, McDonald's had uh, paid Justin Timberlake $5 million to sing the first global advertising jingle, right? Um, you know, I'm loving it. Um, and so they played with that, right? And they began to film themselves in protests. Uh, okay, there we are. Not loving it. <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, so they organized in April of 20, they started at the day after Thanksgiving in a few American cities. It started uh, in front of um, McDonald's and across the country and it started um, in front of several Walmarts. And they chose the day after Thanksgiving because, you know, families are tired from all the cooking and, you know, they just like, they just want to go grab something quick. Um, and they protested out there and they said, that's really great. I hope you enjoy your meal. We can't even afford to have one, right? The people who serve you cannot afford um, to eat uh, anything. And we didn't have a big Thanksgiving dinner yesterday either. Um, and uh, they also started to <laughs> the day after Thanksgiving at Walmart because what's the day after Thanksgiving? Black Friday. Black Friday, the biggest shopping day of the year. So this became, the Black Friday protest became annual. Um, until over the next few years, until they reached a thousand cities. Um, and um, they also um, almost always involved hunger strikes. And as some of the women from Walmart told me, this is Denise Barlage um, and Venanzi Luna, the leaders of the first strike against the Walmart. This is in Pico Rivera, California, outside of LA. They, they led that strike in 2012. Um, Denise said, you know, I really like to do hunger strikes, and we all do because we're not afraid of being hungry. We know exactly what happens. You know, we know how you stop needing quite as much food, and you know, if you have broth, you can start to feel better. Um, and so, um, so they began using hunger strikes in front of Walmarts across the country on Black Friday. Um, and they did very smart media things. Um, they always had a Santa Claus on their picket lines so that when Santa Claus got arrested, um, they could always have pictures that they would broadcast of, you know, the Scrooges at Walmart arresting Santa Claus. Um, and, you know, the, the, the McDonald's workers also did some very interesting things. So, um, the McDonald's workers organized around the world and they began to realize not just what was different, but how much they had in common. So when I met Blue, he's showing me there his burns on his arms. And he got that because, you know, he said he had, a, he had a 90 second turnaround time, right, that he had to, that he had to do for food in his store. Um, and, you know, all the McDonald's had the same kind of workplace architecture. So, you know, he would just accidentally reach around and, and um, burn his arm, there's not enough space. So, in the summer of 2015, um, the Senate, uh, Human Relations Commission uh, in Brazil invited, because McDonald's was the second largest employer there in Brazil, and in fact the second largest private employer in the world. Um, so Brazil became really interested in the way that McDonald's international policies were driving down wages and safety for workers across Brazil um, in many different industries. So they invited fast food worker organizers from around the world. Blue at 26, was very shocked to get an invitation to speak in front of the Brazilian Senate. Um, and he did go. And the thing he said he found out when he was there um, and met um, these folks from Manila, um, Sister Nice and uh, Jay Kataman, who's another Manila fast food worker organizer, is that um, they all had the same scars oh, wow. in the same place. And so they're like, okay, these are literally the brands of wage slavery. And we all have them, right? We are, he, Blue said it's cheesy, but we're, you know, we're McBrothers and sisters, right? We, we understand this. So what started to happen remarkably is every year um, on April 15th, as in Fight 415, um, they would have global protests. And in McDonald's around the world, and I mean around the world, six of seven continents, 
40 countries, hundreds of cities, McDonald's workers would walk out for one day. They did it in 2013, 2014, 2015, um, 2016. Um, and they began um, to have a, you know, a global sense and they began to argue um, for, uh, you know, for a living wage. But in other parts of the world, one of the things that I found about this movement, apart from the fact that it's very young, is that they were really interested in creating a new kind of protest. Um, and what, what, uh, what Lay told me is that, um, you know, this isn't your grandmother's revolution, right? This isn't your grandmother's protest. We didn't want to just carry picket signs. We wanted to do something fun. I had read about the protest in Manila where all the fast food workers walked out in one of those, one of those global protests. And, and uh, it turned out that you had this conga line of 16-year-old girls um, singing Let It Go from the Disney um, movie Frozen. Right? And, you know, changing the lyrics just a little bit, but, you know, um, you know, I'm not scared, turn your back, let it go. And, you know, they would literally go in the conga line into the store, pull people out from behind the counter, um, and march um, through the streets of, of Manila. So, um, so the, the fast food workers movement there um, is called the RESPECT Fast Food Workers Alliance. Um, and, um, not surprisingly, um, their theme song is R-E-S-P-E-C-T, um, the Aretha Franklin hit. Um, so they actually decided uh, to try to choreograph their protests. And this young man, Lake Adaman, was a musical theater major from the University of the Philippines. And he said, I just decided I wanted to do something with my degree rather than audition and not get parts. So he um, started to choreograph civil disobedience protests. Um, that block traffic um, on the streets of Manila. And what he said to me is it takes so long to get anywhere in Manila because there's so many vehicles, there are so few traffic lights. Um, it's, you know, it basically takes three hours to get anywhere. He said, so if you block traffic and slow people down, you better entertain them. Um, <laughs> and so they did. Um, you know, they had a, uh, the year after I was there in 2016, um, they blocked traffic all over the city at rush hour. Um, singing revised words to Katy Perry's firework. Um, and, um, and what became really interesting is that um, they drew in poor, you know, they drew in a new group that joined them. Again, these interesting labor solidarities. Um, there was one neighborhood that was known for its great dancers um, in Manila and, and you know, to, to fight poverty, all these kids would enter, um, they would enter dance contests. Um, and uh, so they became the choreographers, you know, all over the city. So they were there, you know, for these flash mobs, um, you know, throughout the, the duration of, of the movement. Um, and they unionized, right? So um, in, in Manila, um, there was a kind of a union that was similar to Fight for 15 as I met them in Florida. It was, um, it was dancers. It was, um, it was vendors, street vendors, right? People who had not unionized before. It was fast food workers. Um, and it was homeless people, it was squatters, right? Who began to argue for certain rights based on the parts of the city they had lived in for a really long time and, and continued to work in. So people who peeled garlic, you know, piles like this for the, for the restaurants and people who, um, you know, collected food from uh, fast food restaurants that that had been thrown away and they kind of repurposed it and served it, you know, in these vast areas. So um, one of the things we're seeing in this new movement is these really interesting assortment of, um, of, of, of solidarities. Um, so that's a little taste of the fast food workers movement. These folks, um, Prince Jackson and Knute Drayton, um, represented another movement um, that has continued to draw many different kinds of people together, and that's airport workers. Um, because if you go through an airport, there's all kinds of workers there, right? There's service workers, there's people working in stores, there's security workers, um, there's people moving bags. Um, and uh, these men were part of a movement that spread to airports first across the United States. By the time they were done, I met them in 2015, a few years later, um, they had organized um, 20 airports, the 20 biggest airports um, in the United States um, for increased wages. When I met them, they were organizing 
um, with, uh, Kennedy, uh, LaGuardia, and Newark airports um, to get all these folks from different kinds of, of, of work, work experiences in the airports into unions. You know, the idea before that was that this wasn't possible, right? You, you know, you have to organize in one industry. Um, and so, so all of that is going on in the last 10 years. And airport wages have gone, have skyrocketed. They're not, they're, you know, they're nowhere near what they need to be, um, but they've had a great deal of success. And these are traditional unions. The fast food workers um, have joined union confederations, um, but they haven't quite figured out how to uh, make a union of the four million um, fast food workers in um, the United States. But the airport workers did. Um, and these folks, I just wanted to tell you their story a little bit, the big box workers. Um, now, we're seeing this now, right? We're seeing the big box workers. Um, there's a, a revived movement, and, and we can talk about it at the end if you want, the stuff that's going on now um, in Amazon warehouses um, and in, um, you know, in, in, in many of the, the big box grocery stores, especially the cafes. We'll, we'll get to that. But these, these folks, um, decided to try to unionize um, their Walmart, um, and eight Walmarts across the LA area started out. Now Walmart, what they would do is, anytime there was a union drive, they would just shut the store down. Um, and say, uh, you know, in this case, they, they said it was plumbing problems. Um, but, um, but Denise and Venanzi um, started a, a movement. They, they talked about, um, you know, their fear uh, finally you know, walking out when they when they made their first strike in in 2012, um, and you know, just not knowing what was going to happen, and these buses drove up, and out of these buses, while they were out there trying to build the picket line, came Walmart workers um, from Uruguay, from South Africa, from Ecuador, from Italy, um, and they were all unionized. <laughs> they were all unionized, so. Um, they began to think, you know, they realized the only way for little people like us um, to, you know, to fight a corporation that Walmart is bigger than McDonald's. It's the biggest private employer in the world. And it is, it is below only, at least a few years ago, I haven't looked at the statistics for today, but when I was doing this research and when the book came out, it was, um, it was only below two public employers, the U.S. and Chinese militaries. So it is a vast global employer. Um, and um, to have its workers thinking globally and organizing globally um, is, is, is quite a remarkable thing. Um, and the main issue was, um, was people getting hurt. Because Walmart, um, Walmart flagrantly violated um, the Pregnancy Discrimination Act of 1978, which said you had to make accommodations for pregnant workers. Um, and I talked to people who, you know, who were asked, you know, when they were very pregnant, you'd have to, you know, climb up ladders and bring down heavy appliances. Um, and uh, there were people having miscarriages in the stores. Um, the, the U.S. government never fully went after them. But eventually, uh, an organization of Walmart workers called Respect the Bump, um, was uh, successful in working together with um, some a, a, a lawyers group and a, and a women's health group called Better Balance, um, and uh, and suing alongside the UPS workers in 2015 um, uh, for uh, fuller accommodations for the pre for pregnant workers, and um, Walmart still mostly evades because it's so big. It still mostly evades. Um, federal regulations, um, but, um, but they have raised their wages. Um, the surveillance is slightly less um, than it was, but um, this woman, Jenny Mills, wanted to let me know that she was actually the representative of an organization of homeless Walmart employees. Right? They worked full time and still could not afford, she'd been living in that car for two years. Um, before we spoke. She had her plants in there, her cat, and she was parked outside of a Denny's um, where every, you know, the workers were like, yeah, fast food workers, we, we're, we're, you know, we're in the same struggle. Come in, wash up, we'll feed you. Um, and so um, one of the things that's, worth, that's important to remember um, is 
that uh, there, there are tremendous sacrifices in, in all of this um, for the folk, there's just incredible courage um, for all these people who are organizing um, and, and a desire, you know, a desire for, for a living wage and for better food, but the one thing I found everywhere um, was one word. She's wearing a shirt that says Our Walmart, and Our Walmart stands for Organization United for Respect, right? You saw, um, you know, you saw the fast food workers, right? This is everybody, we all deserve respect. And then the Manila organization, the RESPECT Fast Food Workers Alliance. I interviewed um, a woman um, who was involved in Respect the Bump and who also had led um, what they called freedom rides um, of Walmart workers to Benton from across the country to Bentonville, Arkansas to protest um, in front of uh, the corporate headquarters. And, um, and the, uh, you know, she said it was, it was a very shocking experience because their own employees sent police dogs um, at them, which made them feel that they were, in fact, freedom riders. And what Gershwila Green said to me is, the thing that really struck her is that she knew how many of the people in that audience were hungry um, because of the substandard wages and the fact that Walmart intentionally kept people's hours lower than um, the, the threshold, um, the, you know, above which they'd have to give people benefits. Um, and, and she said she knew all that, but they just wanted to talk about respect. They wanted to talk about um, how, you know, every morning Walmart managers would bring the employees in and berate them before they started to work. And they would make them feel expendable. Um, and, um, and, you know, one of, the, one of the women who organized, um, Evelyn Cruz, who I read about in this book, um, said her breaking point came when um, a worker whose child was, was dying of leukemia was told, you know, if you take any more time off, you know, you, you, you're going to lose your job, so decide. And she thought, well, <laughs> this is, you know, unbelievably inhumane. Um, and so, um, so much of these movements, it, you know, it, it is not just about living wage. Um, it's also about respect. Um, and it's also, it's also um, in many cases, a women's movement. So these same McDonald's workers and the Walmart workers, but the McDonald's workers in particular in 2018 and 2019 struck um, in several cities, I think it was a dozen across the US, um, against sexual harassment um, on the job. Um, and they launched, um, they launched, I think, 50 suits, uh, lawsuits against McDonald's. They brought down the CEO of the company because he had turned out was he himself was harassing um, people in the company. Um, but, um, but this was really interesting. Everywhere I went to when I talked to all these organizers, um, they were organizing against sexual harassment, so many of them were women. So in the Bangladesh garment workers, um, the hotel workers, um, the McDonald's workers, the Walmart workers were organizing. Um, that, that drove them as part of this, you know, this desire for respect. Um, you know, as well as the racial justice component that Blue talked about. Um, and, um, and they were also organizing for um, they were also organizing for, against pregnancy discrimination, for greater representation of women in unions. So it was a women's movement. It was um, very much, and here we have um, some Vietnamese activists, um, Tarot Sok and Vu Nam, um, who were, um, I guess we'll talk a little bit about the garment workers, not only in Bangladesh, but in Cambodia, um, women garment workers, as in, as 100 years ago, almost all of these millions of people who make our clothes um, are women, often young women, um, often uh, women from farm families who've lost their lands due to international investment, and they find themselves, you know, having to, to move to cities and do the best they can, um, like uh, Vu Nam, the, the young woman with the, the dark shirt without the glasses, had to leave her home at 15 and find herself in Phnom Penh. Um, and they too, like, um, like the fast food workers in, in the Philippines, um, they too used music and art um, as a way to organize. It wasn't just though that they wanted to entertain people. Um, the Hun Sen dictatorship in Cambodia um, is supposed to be a left-wing dictatorship, but um, it, is, it is mostly a dictatorship and, um, and the, the garment industry is, is the driver of the economy there as it is in Bangladesh. Um, and so 
um, when the workers started to organize, um, there, was, there were some very, very severe crackdowns and protests were made illegal. So I just wanted to give you a flavor of the kind of creativity they used. Um, Vunem uh, started a band called Messenger Band, a girl rock band. Um, and they went around, they learned people's stories. Um, they learned the stories of garment workers. Um, and they made songs and they played them. Right? They went around to the countryside and they had these concerts um, and they played the songs, you know, one was called Garment Workers Tears, um, one was called No to Privatization. Um, and when, they, when she was arrested, she was like, I'm, you know, I'm just a singer in a band, right? I'm not, I'm not an activist. Um, Tart Soak organized fashion shows in which the people who make our clothes um, would um, would march out wearing the clothes, and particularly the sneakers. Our expensive running shoes are the driver of, of millions of jobs um, around the world. Um, and they came out with signs um, in the fashion show, right? They're just doing a fashion show, so again, they, they evaded arrest. Um, and they came out with signs showing um, their wages and the wages, the income, annual income of Phil Knight of Nike, um, and of Sam Walton of Walmart, and of um, you know, they, they, they went down the line, the German company that, um, you know, that runs Reebok and Adidas. Um, and, it, you know, again, it was remarkable courage. Um, I can't overemphasize, you know, to be organizing in the Philippines under Duterte, to be organizing in Cambodia under Hun Sen, to be organizing in Bangladesh um, under Sheikh Hasina. Um, people serve time in jail. Um, they, they risk their lives. Um, but their creativity and their, um, and their spirit were remarkable. Um, so I just want to um, close by talking a little bit about um, the, the, gar the farm workers um, that I talked to. So globalization has affected agriculture, um, you know, every bit as much as it's affected uh, everything else. And um, this, the, the Oaxacan migrant stream, I mean, there are two things I, want, I, I talk about in the book, berries and rice. Um, so, um, you know, very quickly, you know, rice is the staple food of the world, right? More people depend on rice um, than, uh, than any other food. Um, and uh, there has started to be a battle between those who grow um, real rice in places like um, the Philippines and India um, and parts of China um, and, you know, the many, many, many varieties of heirloom rice um, and uh, the bioengineered rice um, that uh, the GMO rice that, that Monsanto and other um, big corporations are trying to force, you know, countries to, um, to have their farmers use. So, you know, there, so the Philippines was a really interesting example. I was there. I also, um, along with the fast food workers, got to meet um, the sort of members of an organization that was literally called RICE, um, and that stood for Revitalizing Indigenous um, Cultivation Enterprises. Now, the Philippines had been growing rice for 2,000 years, and they had unbelievable technologies to grow climate-resistant rice on the rice terraces um, in Luzon, on the, the big island near, um, you know, north of, of um, Manila. And all of a sudden, right, supposed green revolution, we're going to help everybody, we're going to, you know, get rid of hunger, right, there's all of this supposed golden rice flooding into the Philippines. Um, International Monetary, Monetary Fund and World Bank loans to the country um, were predicated on the willingness of that country um, to be distributing these seeds to their farmers and saying you have to, you know, you've got, this is what you should be growing. Criminalizing the exchange of seeds. I see a seed library book. Criminalizing the exchange of seeds so that one of their civil disobedience actions um, was in spite of Monsanto pushed intellectual property laws around rice seeds all over the world, they saved their best seeds and they exchanged them, right? So that they continued to grow. But, but I, talk, I talked to a rice scientist. Um, actually, there was a whole bunch of people who trained right here at the School for International Training um, who uh, worked with that organization, Rice. And, um, and one of the rice scientists said, we lost thousands and thousands of varieties. The Philippines went from the biggest rice growing and exporting um, population, country in the world, to the biggest rice importing country in the world, right? Um, and, you know, and again, um, all these heirloom rices 
um, you know, they had protein, they had vitamins, they could sustain people, they could really be a staple, right? These new bioengineered rices, um, you know, were hulled and, and, you know, produced diabetes and tooth decay and you couldn't, you couldn't really, and so people were having, you know, all kinds of, um, of, of health issues um, and malnutrition. So um, one of the things that the rice people did was um, not only revitalize many parts of the rice terraces, um, outside of Manila, but then instead of saying, don't eat the golden rice, you don't need golden rice to get your beta carotene, and they started, you know, community gardens. So community gardens is a piece of this story, um, you know, to fight malnutrition all over the world, in our cities here, um, and in cities um, around the world. Um, and in India, um, were unbelievable protests, unbelievable protests, um, uh, led, some of you may know the, um, the, uh, agroecology activist, um, Vandana Shiva, who's organized um, amazing, you know, there have been like state long human chains, you know, to block the transport of some of these kinds of, um, of rices into India and to protest, um, protest these trade agreements and these intellectual property laws. So, so there's that movement going on. Um, and then in the United States um, and in Mexico, in our own migrant stream, um, uh, I write about berries. Why do I write about berries? Most of you in here, or many of you in here, are, are you know my age or thereabouts, and you know you can remember. I mean, berries were a summer treat. Berries were great. You had berries in the summer, and then you waited till next summer. Maybe you picked them and froze them, right? And then all of a sudden, berries were 12 months a year, mm -hmm. right? They were everywhere 12 months a year in all the stores. Um, that was, and they were. Um, the biggest seller for the biggest mega corporations. So two corporations play in here. <clears throat> um, one is Driscoll's, which literally um, controlled the growth of half the strawberries in the world. Right. So you know an absolute, the absolute definition of a monopoly. Um, and and um, uh, there. There are companies that are not as big in Washington State, but also are shipping blueberries out um, to the rest of the world. But Driscoll's is, you know, it's the Walmart equivalent. And Walmart is the other company that's involved in this story because one in four American grocery dollars is spent at Walmart. And their biggest selling and biggest profit making food is berries. So these are the people who picked the berries. Um, Arsenio and Anastasia Lopez, um, and uh, mother and son, and, and Anastasia's, um, Anastasia's uh, father and grandfather. Right? It's the same family that would go back and forth um, from their farms um, in the mountains of Oaxaca and do the migrant, the migrant path, right? But up through Sinaloa, and then Baja California, and then Southern California, and all the way up um, to Washington State. And they would never, you know, in the Bracero program, you know, at least they could come. You know, they could come across above ground when that was gotten rid of. Uh, Anastasia's husband would come across um, illegally, and um, you know, and she told me how he would hide. He'd have to hide in holes, right? They, you know, everybody knew these big companies were bringing in these workers, um, but um, you had to hide in holes in the ground when 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 La Migra before ice uh, came. And um, so these workers began organizing um, along the whole migrant chain. And in 2015, I got their attention, I, they drew my attention um, through two strikes. Um, one started in 2013 in Washington State, right, where you had Mixteco and um, um, Zapoteco and Triqui, the three major indigenous groups from um, Oaxaca come and pick. They went on strike. Um, and they highlighted certain things we didn't know before. They highlighted the fact that berries were, yeah, on the berry farms where they picked, um, the companies would bring in, um, they'd bring in security who were, they dressed to look like the U.S. military. So that, um, so that the workers thought if we protest, right, we're going to be deported. They weren't deported, they were tased. Um, and this man, Bernardino Martinez, um, fought back and sued. Um, he was organizing for United Farm Workers and, um, and he, was, he was tased and beaten and, and um, he fought back 
in that, from that strike, he was striking down in Oxnard, California, the, the, in Ventura County, where there are tens of thousands of indigenous farm workers. Um, and, and he won in court. Um, and little by little, you began to get these interesting um, labor formations up and down the coast, um, culminating in 2015 in a strike of 50,000 berry pickers um, just south of the border um, in Baja, California, where um, if you look, most of the berries you buy say Mexico. Even the organic ones say, say Mexico. Um, and there's these vast, vast um, factory farms um, in Baja, California. And they, they organized them um, and they, uh, they did more than that. They burned the fields. Um, 50,000 workers went on strike. They blocked um, the road, the Pan American Highway that brought berries up to the United States. And then Walmart got involved, interestingly. Um, and, um, and, they, um, and they actually negotiated a deal um, for these workers with the state of Baja California because they wanted their berries to come. And that gave a really, that created a really good idea. I know I've been talking forever, so I'll stop after this. Um, that created a really good idea that has revolutionized um, agricultural organizing and that we are going to see, I think, a great deal more of and that is active right now with dairy workers in Vermont. And that is to say that it isn't always the farmers that you need to go after. It's the big buyers. It's the Walmart. Um, it's the fast food places that buy tomatoes. So this was um, done by the Immokalee workers, indigenous tomato pickers in Florida. Um, and, um, and so the idea is they have fought sexual harassment on farms. They have fought um, the kinds of horrible conditions that people are forced to live in on these farms. Um, and they have fought for a living wage, um, but, but not by just demanding more from the farmers, um, by demanding uh, when Walmart signed an agreement um, that they would only buy tomatoes that were produced under fair food conditions. Um, it was such a big deal that the UN um, you know, sent someone down to, to talk about how um, you know, the Florida tomato fields had gone from one called the ground zero for modern slavery to this model um, agricultural workplace. Uh, right now, Migrant Justice in Vermont um, has been waging a campaign. They waged it for years to try to get Ben and Jerry's to pay dairy farmers more um, and to allow workers um, to inspect conditions so that people lived in decent housing in a Vermont winter um, and that they got a basic living wage. They're now still in a campaign um, uh, with Hannaford's, which is uh, the biggest grocery buyer. Um, of, of Vermont milk. So um, this is an interesting new development in worker in, in organizing that, that we're seeing now. Um, anyway, I, I want to stop here except to say that um, you know since this book has come out, the labor movement has exploded, right? And we're seeing almost 400 Starbucks now, our union have voted to unionize on my campus. So at, at higher education workers, Given the conditions we described on my campus, three new, I was, I've been there 30 years. There was one union, three new unions have appeared in the last year. Um, uh, Rutgers also, you had um, uh, adjuncts, uh, uh, graduate students, and service workers go on strike, and the professors who were tenure track join them. Uh, 9,000 on strike, they're about to, to settle a deal that will you know, dramatically increase wages. Um, and you know, give people better long-term contracts. So, um, you know, since I started this, the the labor movement, which was seen as dead, um, is coming back in all kinds of really interesting ways. So, um, since I'm a relentless optimist, let me stop on that. <laughs> on that. really inspiring and thank you for your optimism. <laughs> I always appreciate that. I have to try. Exactly, I appreciate it. Um, yeah. Just, it, who has, uh, no. no, yes. Uh, when you're talking about berries being 12 months a year, um, is that, did you find that the California berry pickers, the migrants, were then ineligible for the H-2A program because they were working year round or were they still seasonal workers who could yeah, no, they were, um, they, most of them were not in any kind of official guest worker program. Everyone I interviewed, I, I, I worked with a group called the Mixteco Community Organizing Project in Oxnard, um, and now they're in like a bunch of California towns around there. Um, everyone's illegal. 
everyone, um, you know, is undocumented. And, um, you know, and, and they said, they actually, ironically, some, you know, the older generation spoke of the Bracera program with a certain amount of nostalgia, you know, as humiliating as it was and as underpaid as it was that they could walk, you know, come across without, you know, the horror. Arsenio, the, the, the son and the, the mother-son couple that I um, showed you pictures of is the, um, is the director now of the Mixed Echo Community Organizing Project, but he only got his green card. He's been here for 22 years, and I think he, he had to walk across the border. It took him four times, and he was, you know, held by bandits under gun and, you know, beaten, and it was a horrendous thing. Um, he, he finally got a green card. He's been running this incredible organization. So um, that's a big problem, like the dairy workers here. Also, dairy is not allowed to hire guest workers. So everybody, all Vermont dairy workers practically are, are undocumented, which is a crazy situation, especially because Americans don't want to do work. Yeah. Um, United Farm Workers, uh, my association goes back to yeah. uh, the uh, Is it still, um, why isn't it big? Why isn't it national? Um, you know, they did, of course, their nas the national boycott campaign that was so incredibly successful, I think. 17 million people swore off berry, you know, lettuce and grapes. But um, they really atrophied. I mean, he, um, I mean, a lot of great things happened. Um, and they passed the California Agricultural Labor Relations Act. And, you know, so agricultural workers there have rights they don't have anywhere else. But um, it, it, it really diminished. And I think one of the issues is that most of the farm workers now are indigenous. They're not mestizo. Um, and the foremen are, and, the, and the people who are their supervisors are. And I, got, I heard a lot about racism, you know, from Mexican-American foremen on the farms and, and, and white foremen to, to these indigenous workers. So um, they have created their own unions um, and, uh, and, and they're very, very proud of indigenous heritage and they're trying to make contacts with, um, you know, United States-based Native American groups. So if there's one reason, I, I think it's probably it's probably that. But the benefits they won, I mean, farm workers, you know, in the um, National Labor Relations Act, everybody else got an eight hour day, they got 10, right? Um, their minimum wage was lower than the national minimum wage. So um, uh, the fact that they had that in California, they just won, they're now farm workers in California don't have to work longer days than the rest of us. Um, so, so there are benefits to UFW one that are still, that are still helping them, I think. But, but that guy Bernardino, who I said I showed you, he 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 did organize for the UFW. They are still out there organizing. So, um, at the beginning of your your presentation, you said that you know a lot of the, these workers felt like you know they're back in 1911, and so I know that history informs our future. So after you've done this analysis of today and you have probably a very large uh, knowledge of his, uh, labor history going back, can you tell us what kind of predictions you might be able to make about where we may be going based on the history of where we were in 1911? I think starting all over again. I think starting all over again. I mean, I think... In what way? Well, for example, um, even the reason that um, I said it would have taken 166 years to investigate all the complaints for safety violations uh, um, under COVID for essential workers is because they organized and filed them, right? And so I think we're starting again. The difference is we have the laws now. That's the one difference, right? We do have the National Labor Relations Act. It is illegal to fire people for joining the union. So the Starbucks workers have brought so many complaints against Starbucks for firing people who, who are unionizing those cafes the National Labor Relations Board under Biden um, is friendlier to those complaints, not surprisingly, than it was under Trump, where it was headed by um, the guy who was the McDonald's lawyer and who fought all of the suits, you know, waged by these. He's from um, Brattleboro. What? He's from Brattleboro. He's from Brattleboro, okay. Um, anyway. Um, Peter Robb, R O B B. Rob, what? Peter Robb, his name is Peter Robb. Okay, well, you know your stuff. <laughs> You know your stuff. So yeah, so I mean, I, you know, I think they have the laws and that helps, but there's just a tremendous amount of organizing going on, it's amazing. I was, you know, one of the, the new unions on, on our campus is an undergraduate workers union, and so I was interviewing um, some of those young people for 
um, an article I did um, sometime last year for Public Seminar Magazine, and, um, and they said, look, our generation just didn't get the memo that unions are bad, mm -hmm. and they didn't get the memo that unions are dead. They, they're very excited by the labor movement, right? They're, you know, they're out there on the Dartmouth Green singing Solidarity Forever. So, I mean, I do think we're starting over again, and, and it's spreading fast. Progress like in the states in the American South, where you're starting to see, like this year, trying to roll back some of the child labor protections, and the unions making any headway there. I mean, they were very successful in propagandizing unions and getting the, the right to work, which yeah. is basically the right to get fired. Yeah, I mean, the first rollbacks of right to work was 2010 was devastating. I mean, the 2010 midterm elections you know, for labor and, and for women's rights. I mean, most of the laws that laid the groundwork for repealing Roe v. Wade were done, you know, were passed after 2010, and all the right to work laws. So, um, has, have those been rolled back in the South? No, but the shocking thing was that they had passed um, in Michigan and Wisconsin, right, which were two of the, you know, the, the epicenters of the industrial labor movement. Those have been rolled back, um, but, um, especially in Michigan, but, um, but the organizing continues and it's quite remarkable. Um, you know, I uh, spoke with some catfish workers in Mississippi um, and also some uh, car workers in a Nissan plant there. Um, and they're just organizing full steam ahead. You know, are, are, have they won a union? No. Um, part of the reason for that, of course, is that um, it's been made much harder, all the court decisions and, um, you know, and, and state regulations have made it much harder, but um, I, I don't see them stopping and I really do think there is a generational shift that's fascinating to me. I mean, the Amazon plant in Staten Island that successfully unionized, I mean, Chris Smalls, the head of that union, is an old man at 32, right? Everybody, you know, everybody in that, in that union is in their 20s. Um, and some of them in their late teens. So in that sense too, it's like a hundred years ago, right? It's like these young, it's like these young kids organizing the garment industry. Yeah. As consumers, as white, middle class, maybe some of us, some not Americans who buy things, who needs to hear that we support unions? Our politicians? Corporate, our co-ops, boards. Oh, our co-ops are definitely, absolutely. I've been Thank fighting you. a battle against the Hanover Co-op forever on various. Oh. So yeah, so that is a battle we can well, fight. Well, co-ops are fighting the unionization of their workers. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Co-ops are not not corporate. Yeah. Yeah. No, absolutely. I, so I work. Who, who do we need to speak to? Um, it, you know, it's a multi-level thing. Some of it is very local, right? Like, you know, like, like working with your local co-op. Some of it is, edu is, is individual, it's educating yourself. So one of the big victories, um, uh, which is related to this idea of, of making the big companies pay, um, is the Bangladesh Fire and Safety Agreement that was um, passed after um, uh, the Rana Plaza disaster in 2013, which 10 times the number of people died um, in, in Bangladesh garment shops than died in Triangle. Um, and uh, those workers in Kalpona used that um, to get information out around the world. 225 global clothing brands signed on to this agreement. Um, and, the, and the agreement was, um, we, will, um, we will be held responsible for the conditions in the plants where our clothing uh, is made. We will um, allow the, the workers' representative, the union, to choose inspectors to come in and, and look for safety um, violations. We will pay for them to be made, for the repairs to be made. Um, and if we don't, we um, can be sued in our own, our own country, in the courts in our own country. It's a, it was a remarkable agreement to get, you know, H&M and Zara and Primark and some of the big global clothing brands American brands did not sign. Walmart did not sign, Gap did not sign, Sears did not sign, Disney did not sign, um, and the US military did not sign. So that's another place. It's like, A, you know, in terms of what you buy, you can go to the um, Fire and Safety Accord website, and there's plenty of companies to buy from, right? There are, there are hundreds of companies that have signed uh, this agreement. Um, 
but you know, there's also pressure on, you know, on, on corporations and companies that, that haven't signed. Um, so those are all things we can do. As far as berries, um, buy local, freeze them. Don't, you know, don't feed the Driscoll's machine. Because um, the Driscoll's machine is putting small farmers out of business too. I'm very good friends with a tomato grower in Thetford who's waging this real organic project battle against companies like Driscoll. So it's a, you know, as a state that prides itself on our remaining farms and small farms, um, you know, also not feeding the Driscoll's machine is, is, is important for that as well. Yeah. yeah um, I, I don't have a great understanding of like economic theory, so this question might not make that much sense, but it seems to me like whenever they do so, something happens to benefit people on the lower end of the pay spectrum, people on the upper end do something to negate the benefit, like they can raise prices. So if there was a widespread increase in the minimum wage, is there any way to stop that from happening so that people up there just don't suck up all the money that gets added? Yes, um, legislation against share buybacks. So um, hmm. you know, the sorry, workers would what? share buybacks. Okay. The workers were talking to me about that years ago and then um, Bernie Sanders and his campaign started talking about um, regulating share buybacks. What companies do, they make these incredible profits, um, is that they don't redistribute them to the workers. They could, right? They could, give, they could raise the wages. The profits over the last few years have been astronomical. They've been unbelievable. They're not suffering under COVID. Um, and so, um, if, so what they do is instead of giving them to the workers, they buy their own stock <laughs> to raise the price of it. So, um, so that's a really, that's the biggest thing. That just failed on it. I think we're gonna last spring that night. I think the Democrats in Congress tried to pass that and the Republicans. Uh, yep. I mean, we have. Uh, we have work to do. Yeah, and we have the worst. We, there used to be normal, I'm sorry if I'm offending anybody, but there used to sort of be normal Speed up, please. I said, they, I'm sorry, I may offend somebody in this audience, but I'm going to risk that. They used to be sort of normal Republicans. They're so right wing now that they're, Sarah Appleby Sanders just signed in a law, or is about to sign in a law making it legal for 14 year olds. I know. I mean, that's the, instead of letting migrants come here right. and recognize that migrants are the ones that want to do these jobs because no one else will. Yes. Their solution to worker shortage is to have 14 year olds. To have 14 year olds. And so, I mean, yeah, that's what I mean. We're going back 100 years, right? We've got to pass child labor laws again. Um, and, but I do think that is the single, you know, I don't know how we're going to get it done. I mean, the thing, one of the, the things about Fight for 15 that's been so remarkable is that um, they, I mean, obviously the federal government hasn't raised the minimum wage since 2007. It's 7.25 an hour, and for agricultural workers, it's three something, and for waiters and, you know, wait people, it's still like 2.35 an hour. So, um, you know, it's not happening there. But, but they, they did remarkable work in town after town and city after city and then in the states. Um, and that is a real success story. Between 2012 and 2016, these workers um, raised their own wages 12 times the amount that Congress did the last time it raised the minimum wage. So there are, there are real successes and there is work to be done. But share buybacks, it's a really, it's not a sexy issue, right? It's, you know, your eyes glaze over as soon as you say the words. Um, but it's, it's, it's really a big one. Um, my impression is that the big gains after 1911, the biggest gains were gained because unions became more centralized and more large in power and in a way more threatening. Uh, I don't feel that I've been threatened as a, con as a consumer, nor do I see any large uh, conglomeration of these unions forming a international movement. Do you see that happening in the future? Some of these uh, kind of localized things that you describe coming together and forming a network or a or a cent or again a large centralized series of unions. I mean, some of that came, you know, as a result of the New Deal and you know, the creation of structures where, where labor could have a say in, you know, like the, 
the, you know, the National Labor um, Advisory Board that Roosevelt created where, you know, workers and consumers um, and business would, would get together to negotiate standards. Some of that happened. I, I don't, you know, I mean, I think there is still the NLRB, um, and we do see this huge upsurge. You're saying no, no, no. <laughs> oh, okay. We'll talk after. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, um, you know, huge upsurge in organizing. You know, is it going to be like 1937? I don't know. Um, but I do think there are these new forms that are quite remarkable. Um, and the laws, I mean, they're fascinating to me. The things that the Philippine workers were able to pass under these, this horrendous dictator, right? Um, you know, that in the midst of, of even terrible, uh, terrible governments, you know, they have had, they have had, had some impact. You know, I, my, you know, my job is to talk to all my depressed friends and try to get them out of bed in the morning. So <laughs> that's, that's how I do it. But um, I do think, I do think, um, there's, I know it's, it's a big, it's a hard job <laughs> right now, but it's so depressed. And, and rightly so, rightly so. Um, Noel, did you have a, a last oh, yeah. question? Real quick. Uh, you were talking about the Driscoll's machine, and I have thinking about all of the sort of rise in union organizing, in this sort of food systems, in combined with sort of the rise of automation and more sophisticated machinery that can do things like pick strawberries. Um, where do you see the breaking point being between? corporations like Walmart or Driscoll's who can afford to invest in that sort of infrastructure, phasing out workers the same way that the auto industry did when they started to assembly line their factories and lay off people on mass. I, what is interesting to me is that if you go to Ventura County, um, you'll still see people on their knees picking berries because they're so delicate. Mm -hmm. um, but tech is laying off tens of thousands, right? It's like, you know, I think 100,000 people have been laid off by big tech in the last you know, in the last year or so. So I don't know that we know what's coming, but ironically, service work needs people. Yeah. You know, it, it, it does. And, um, you know, there was an attempt to make uh, Trump's first nominee for Secretary of Labor, Andy Puster, I think, um, who had, you know, stolen millions in wage theft from his own workers in California when he was nominated. Um, he, he said he was gonna do that. He said, I'm gonna, I'm gonna automate all my I forget, I forget what his, his chain was. It was a burger chain. Um, and he said, I'm going to automate all those stores. He said, they don't, machines won't come in late. They won't complain. They won't unionize. They won't charge me with sexual harassment. So I'm going to automate it all. Um, but it hasn't happened. Um, and having stayed in one automated hotel um, in, um, in Saigon, it's terrifying. <laughs> it's really scary. Um, I, don't see it, I don't see it replacing service workers. Right, because all one thing has to do is go wrong, and you're, you know, bad, bad things happen. So, you know, will there be layoffs and changes? Sure, you know, there, there always are. But um, I don't know. We're at a paradigm shift. You know, I don't know that I'll see it, but I'm excited that I'm seeing it a little bit. You know, I'm excited that the the, the labor movement seems to be reviving in, in all kinds of interesting ways. Yes. Just a really quick question. I know that was supposed to be the last one, but um, for those of us who are not directly on a daily basis or deeply involved in and steeped in what's going on with labor around the country, around the world, and various movements, is there any outlet or any source that you could recommend where one might stay informed, get more informed, identify sort of where we could offer solidarity to support movements? And yeah. I mean, it's easy now on the web, which is really nice. Um, you know, Clean Clothes Campaign um, uh, is a European site that, that gives you a lot of information. Um, even, even, you know, the much maligned AFL-CIO Solidarity Center has information on campaigns around the world. Um, as I said, the, the, the Bangladesh Fire and Safety, the Building of Port site, you have a very clear sense of who's you know, which companies are, are, are good and bad. Um, so you have to, to surf around a little bit, I don't know. I mean, you know, there are, there are magazines that cover labor more than others, American Prospect, Jacobin, um, but um, yeah, it, it, you, you can find that. It takes, it, it takes a little extra effort, right? That's the thing, it does. Um, are these sources mentioned in your book? Um, some of them are, yes. Some of them are. <laughs>
And I will yeah, say that we, just today, I asked the technical services librarian to um, subscribe us to Jacobin. So Ooh. that's a good one. Yeah, it is. You can also read it online. Yeah. And um, you might see an article of mine in there now and then. I read it. So thank you guys so much. Once um, if again, anyone wants a book, I'll sign it. Um, the money goes to what's the bookstore? Uh, everyone's Books. Everyone's Books. Now, if you want higher wages, let me tell you what to do. You got to talk to the workers in the shop with you. You got to build you a union, got to make it strong. But if you all stick together, boys, it won't be long. You get shorter hours, better working conditions, vacations with pay, take your kids to the seashore. It ain't quite this simple, so I better explain just why you got to ride on the union train. Because if you wait for the boss to raise your pay, we'll all be awaiting till judgment day. We'll all be buried. Gone to heaven. St. Peter will be the straw boss then. Now you know you're underpaid, but the boss says you ain't. He speeds up the work till you're about to faint. You may be down and out, but you ain't beaten. You can pass out a leaflet and call a meeting. Talk it over. Speak your mind. Decide to do something about it. Of course, the boss may persuade some poor damn fool to go to your meeting and act like a stool, but you can always tell a stool, oh, that's a fact. He's got a yaller streak running down his back. He doesn't have to stool. He'll always get along on what he takes out of blind men's cups. You got a union now, and you're sitting pretty. Put some of the boys on the steering committee.